Well, my kids and I watched The Christmas Carol two nights ago for their first time. We watched the Muppets version because I thought it would be less scary, Tale of Scrooge, the ghosts can freak out children. But in hindsight, uh, I think it maybe wasn't scary enough. The Muppets were a little too adorable, especially the uh, ghost of Christmas future was kind of a soft, cuddly Dementor. So by the end of it, when Ebenezer Scrooge was crying at the headstone and repenting about the way he's wasted his life, my children were like, what's he upset about? I'm like, what's he upset about? Oh man, you've missed the whole thing. And I'm like, kids, uh, what he's been learning, Ebenezer Scrooge, is that he has squandered opportunities and through his selfishness wasted his life. And now as he contemplates the end of his life, he realizes he has lived poorly. And so here, contemplating the reality of his death, he's now asking for a chance to recalibrate the way to live his life. And they're like, mm -hmm, okay, wasn't that funny? And I'm like, well, all right. So we haven't fully got the Christmas Carol yet. But there's value in that story, many of us watch every single year, is that, hey, let me contemplate the end of my life, not to just think about the reality that I'm going to die, but so that it will impact the way I live. Now, why bring that up? Because we've been in the series on the story of King David, the great king of the Old Testament, potentially one of the greatest kings, if not the greatest, who's ever lived on the planet. And we're coming towards the end of David's story. We're going to contemplate the end of his life that it may impact our own. What we're going to see today are the last words of the king. Uh, it's interesting, the Puritans long ago really valued the last words someone would say before they die because they realized, hey, this might give us a window into the experience of crossing into the next life. Or as someone's about to die, suddenly all that's uh, shallow and frivolous fades away. Maybe what they say will show what's really valuable or give some window into their character, how their life was lived. And I've certainly seen that to be true. I, I bought a book called, entitled Famous Last Words, and it was the last words of several people, like the great businessman and circus founder P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey. His last recorded words were, so how were the receipts at Madison Square Garden? Uh, we find out at the end what he valued. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, his last words were he turned to his wife and said, you are wonderful. And then he clutched his chest and passed away, right? Uh, John Sedgwick, famous last words. He was the major general of the Union Army as they squared off against Confederate troops in Spotsylvania. And as he was setting up his men, they came under sniper fire from the Confederates. And he watched some of his men duck. And his last words were turning to a man and say, stand up, man, they couldn't hit an elephant from this distance. <laughs> so I don't know what your last words may be. Uh, but if they're going to give us a window into our lives, are we going to go out well? What will be the song you're singing that will be the soundtrack of your life? We're going to hear it in David. And yet it brings up a problem for us. And the problem is this. David's life is covered with, with such detail in the book. You have three books that talk about the end of David. You have Samuel wrap up the end of David's life in 2 Samuel. Then you have Kings wrap up David's life in the book of Kings. And then you have the Chronicles wrap up David's life in the book of Chronicles. So everyone who preaches the life of David suddenly has a decision to make. Which, who gets the last word on David's last words? And you see Samuel takes us back to, to David at his best. And, and we see the David the poet constructing a hymn of praise to the Lord. You see, kings were led to David's bedside. Were led as he grips Solomon's hands and as a father whispers his last words to his son. And then Chronicles shows us his last words as king as he stands before his people and issues a final charge before he leaves this world. We see David as he was, David the poet, David the father, David the king. Which one gets the last word? Well, most pastors choose one. But uh, as we've done in this series, I will now attempt to give them all to you. Uh, now, I can't explain. It's too much. So let me sum up. We'll look at a few passages and figure out what the last words of the king mean for how we live our lives on these days in the earth. So we'll start with 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22, the author there flashes back to, to David's best days, to the happiest days of David's life. It's, it's what we do at funerals. Uh, when you pass away, uh, when we walk into your funeral moment, what pictures will be up? We, we don't put up pictures of your strength ebbing away on the hospital bed. When you pass away, we put up the pictures of you in the flower of your youth. You at your best, you at your strongest, you with the silkiest hair. That's the you we put in front of you. We put in front of you the best. 
And in Samuel, he does that. He, at the end of the book, he flashes back to the young, triumphant David. And you see it in 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. It says, And David spoke to the Lord these words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. David trusted God, and when he became king, Israel was literally surrounded by enemy nations that would attack them from all sides. David was able to subdue all their enemies, bring in peace, and he had lived faithfully and trusted God and obeyed even when he was attacked unfairly by Saul. We see a faithful David celebrating God. What's the first thing we see David do well at the end of his life? We watch David praise. And we watch David praise a God who saves And in verse two, he says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. Call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. You see, he grabs eight metaphors about God. God is a rock. God is a fortress. God is a shelter. God is a a savior. He goes on and on about what God is. God is all these things that when I was in danger, he was a refuge for me. When I was in trouble, he came out and waged war to get me. Through the rest of the poem, he uses this beautiful imagery of a flood. He said, all my enemies were around me, were coming in on me. I was like someone who was caught up in water, being flooded. I was overwhelmed. But he says, and in my distress, I cried out. And the Lord rode forth on his chariot. And the Lord came and he rescued me. The Lord set me on a rock. The Lord saved me. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. It's fascinating. David was the great warrior king, the slayer of Goliath, the subduer of the Philistines. David was the great warrior, but at the end of his life here, he's not thumping his chest saying, I did it my way. I beat all these people. At the end of his life, he's not bowing up about his strength. He's saying, you know what I was? I was a helpless child. I was a drowning man. And as I look back on my life, It's the Lord who rescued me out of the enemy's hands. It's the Lord who set my feet on a rock and made my footsteps firm. God, he doesn't see his own power. He praises a God who's powerful enough to save. Uh, President Andrew Jackson, I read his biography on accident about a year ago. I won't go into the details of how that occurred. But Andrew Jackson, by many accounts, was not a nice man. And he uh, had a very rough life, was almost killed many times, starting from his youth by British soldiers who hit him in the face with a gun. Like he had a very difficult life and grew up a very hard man. And yet after he was president, at the end of his life, someone convinced him finally to go to church. And while he was in church, the pastor saw him in the back and the pastor began to weave his story into his sermon. Sometimes pastors do that when they see someone start vaguely telling their story as an illustration. I won't tell you if I've done that to you or not. You might know. But he starts recounting moments of being rescued from invasion when he was young, being rescued in here and there, but he's using generalities to describe all these different moments of being saved out of battle, saved out of trouble, saved out of turmoil. And so other people were just listening to the story, but Andrew Jackson knew this guy's telling my life story. And he says, do you think it's possible for someone to see God come through to preserve their life over and over again, and for them to not realize that it's the Lord who has saved them, that God has given them life for a purpose and a reason? And he left that service and it bothered him. And so he called the pastor to come to his house. And the pastor was busy ministering to other people, which bothered him again. You don't tell me no. But then he was forced to sit at home and to realize my power is limited. And yeah, at the end of the day, there were many moments where I was helpless. And I'm here, not by my strength, not by my might, but by grace. And this old, at times cruel man bent his knees and surrendered his life to Jesus right at the end because he realized, no, when I was surrounded by many waters, he saved me and he praised a savior who put sweetness in him right on his deathbed. See, it's fascinating that David talks about God as a rock. Uh, Military strategist, that's important. A place to find stability and shelter. He's a fortress, a stronghold, a place of safety. And he's a warrior that rode out to save me. He is all those things. And yet, if you notice, David doesn't just do that propositionally. God is a rock. God is a savior. God is a provider. Notice the pronouns. He is my rock. 
He is my deliverer. He is my fortress. I cried out and he saved me. Friend, God is a rock. God is a fortress. God is a refuge. He is a shelter. He is a savior. What's of paramount importance today is, is he yours? This is where true spirituality starts. This is the best you could do with your life. This is the best we could offer you that you would bow your knee to trust a God like that because there will be a soundtrack to your life. Your life will sing about something. I listened the other day to a song, the enormous talents of Eminem (laughs) singing about little pills. And I was like, is that it? All that talent focused on a substance? Is that the story? What's the storyline of your life going to be? What's the soundtrack at your funeral? I did it my way. I'm too sexy for this shirt. (laughs) Or the Lord is my rock and my shelter. Let me tell you something. The world does not need more of you because you'll fade. We love you and you have gifts to give to the world. But at the end of the day, the hope every human being needs is a God who cannot fail them and will not fail them, who will save them and give them stability like a deer on the heights can be stable and to face the challenges of the world because he trains my hands for war, that God is a savior and a supplier. We need a God like that. And the best you can do with your life is bow your knee to him. That's where it starts. I need rescue, and we have a rescuing God who's come. And so Samuel closes the book on David's life by saying, that's who David was. David, at his heart, was a worshiper. And the most elemental statement of faith is, I called to him, and he answered me. Have you done that? It's the most important thing. But then we get to 1 Kings, and we find that David says, hey, not only am I praising a God who saves, I'm preaching a God who leads that we're meant to come to faith in this God and then we're meant to walk with this God. And the way he gets to that in 1 Kings is really fascinating. 1 Kings is the different one where where Samuel's the sentimental one. Let's come in in your funeral and tell stories of, of you at your best. Here in Kings, we see David on the deathbed. Uh, It's interesting. I I had a weird moment um, last Sunday, actually, here. Uh, While I was preaching, I looked into this section. It's it's weird that in both gatherings, the chair was empty, too. Uh, It's bizarre. But there was someone sitting right there that looked exactly uh, like the young man whose funeral was the first I had ever done. Um, I was a youth pastor. He was one of my students. Died way too soon. And... uh, and so last week, I just, this kid looked just like him. It actually threw me off the whole gathering um, because I remember preaching this kid's funeral and he had come to faith in Jesus early and it just flowed out of him. I mean, this kid was the most Jesus-like person I knew. So while his funeral was very sad to preach, it wasn't hard be- because we all preach our own funerals. You know that, Right? Like, if you die, I'll stand up here and say something nice about you. But everyone who's there knows who you were, right? There's that old story of a man that was a rascal that died, and at his funeral, the pastor stood up there and had to say something. So he said he was a loving father and devoted husband and and faithful worker. And the story is the wife turned to the kids and said, can you peek in the casket and see if that's your father? (laughs) Because we know what you were. And what was beautiful about this kid's funeral is I could tell stories that helped encapsulate who he was and everyone nodded along. Yeah, yeah, we saw that. He trusted in a God who saves and he walked with a God who leads. And there's a testimony of grace running through the thread of his life. That's what your funeral will be like. But, but if you pass away, we'll think about that. We'll tell moments of those, of those stories of those moments that, that best displayed your character. But then also when someone passes, you also think of the last moment you had with them. And that's what I thought of when I drove home. It's it's not just that young man's funeral, but the last conversation we were able to have. And and it's fascinating. In Kings, that's what it does. It it doesn't take you to the kind of beautified funeral. It it takes you to the raw moment of David in bed. And in Kings, we won't have time to read it all, but I'll read it. It's him when he's infirm. David's not doing well. First Kings talks about he's in bed and he's shivering cold and he can't get warm. Some of you know that feeling. And so they throw blankets on him. They can't keep him warm. And so finally they throw a virgin in bed with him, see if she'll keep him warm, which is not something advocated by scripture, by the way. (laughs) But the Bible I love just shows you life in all its weirdness because you're weird and so are they and so are we. And the Bible doesn't spare you from that. 
And so they throw her in bed and it says, David is, he doesn't even sleep with her, which is to show you how much virility and strength David has lost. Again, not advocated by the Bible. It's bizarre, not good. But they go, man, this guy really is feeling it. Uh, So he's in bed, dying, strength gone. And his son, Adonijah, gets tired of waiting for his dad to die and decides, I'm going to declare myself king. So he gets his chariot. He gets 50 horses. He rides into town. He goes to a building. He calls forward Joab, the commander of the army, and Abathar, the priest. And he gets all his brothers. And he declares himself king, gets his military and religious power, and says, I'm going to be king. And conspicuously does not invite David, Bathsheba, Solomon, or Nathan the prophet. So Nathan and Bathsheba run to David and say, your son just declared himself king because that's what happens when you're impatient about honoring somebody's death. It's usually because you're filled with arrogance. And that's Adonijah. The arrogant can't honor somebody. Can't even wait for them to die. And so Adonijah sees his power and they run to David and say, hey, this young man's trying to usurp you and he didn't invite us, which means we're gonna be public enemy number one in a few minutes. But the Lord said that Solomon would be king. And we saw that two weeks ago. He did. And yet it's fascinating for me to watch that. David is on his deathbed, uh, dying, knows Solomon is going to be king, but he can't bless him yet. Isn't that wild? It's so hard to let go of power. And sometimes it's so hard to bless. And some of us wait too long when it's in our power to do good. And yet David here at the end is being told, here's your moment. And so he brings Solomon in and he tells them, put him on my chariot put in front of him the new commander, Amasa, and put in front of him Nathan, and put in front of him Zadok, the true priest, have them ride through Jerusalem in my chariot, sit him on my throne, and let him rule. And he does it, and they blow the trumpet. Solomon's king, and all the people rejoice at that, and they're rejoicing so loud that Adonijah and his party hears it, and his party's like, whoops, gotta go. And they all leave. Adonijah realizes he's in trouble. He runs to the horns of the altar and grabs it so he doesn't die. And then in Second, or First Kings chapter 2, we get David's last words to Solomon, and he tells him, Be strong, show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways. Keep his statutes and his commandments, his rules and his testimonies as is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. It's a beautiful statement. He looks at him and says, be strong, show yourself a man. Well, some people are put off by that. Like, whoa, what is that supposed to mean? Well, notice what he says a man is. Be strong, show yourself a man, obey the Lord's commandments. What a great command for what a man is. Walk with your God. The warrior king who fought for you, you walk with him now for a lifetime. That's a great definition of a man. When David did that as a man, he used his power to bless people. When David didn't do that, women lost and his kids lost. We saw that two weeks ago, right? And so man, woman, if you're in here, you want a man to be defined as someone who walks in accordance with the words of God. But then David does something interesting. He was like, Solomon, walk in the ways of God. And Joab, you're going to want to kill that guy. And Shimei, you're probably going to want to kill him too. And it, it turns Godfather real fast. That's First Kings. It's like, hey, Joab, his gray hair goes down in blood. The one that tries to marry my concubine, he's the traitor. And you're like, what is this? It's real life. And it's the king talking to the next king, saying, Joab, at times of peace, murdered his political adversaries. He's not safe. And to keep around somebody who doesn't fear God and doesn't fear the king is dangerous. And Shimei tried to lead a coup too. So you be careful. These are people in your circle that don't want good for you. They will hurt you. And as a king, you have to restrain evil. That's what kings do with their power, restrain evil for the sake of good. And so it sounds kind of dark, but at the end of it, Solomon does that. Tries to show mercy on Adonijah, Donisha tries to usurp him one more time. Sorry, you got to go. Joab runs away from him. Sorry, Joab, you got to go. Shimei, you got to go. And so Solomon axes everybody that's a rival and the kingdom is secure. How on earth do we apply this? Well, let me say, what I love that David does is David says, get this word of God into you study these commandments and these laws. David looks back at his life and said, the best decisions I ever made were the decisions that teed off of this book. Walk according to this law. The the greatest griefs in David's life are when he didn't. It's when Bathsheba lost. It's when his people lost, Uriah lost. You walk with this word. And whatever person or thing will rival that, you need to uproot it. 
You need to pull it out of your life. You need to plant into your life the word of God and you need to uproot from your life anything that will keep you from walking with the Lord. That, that's the best takeaway from us. So David praises a God who saves and then he preaches a God who leads. And so Solomon, key off of his word. Get this in your head. And let me tell you something, church, as I prepared this, I, I thought about you a lot. Let me say, I am so glad you're here. Whether you've come here to church every week or this is new for you, I'm so glad you're here. The potential for life change is alive and present every time we open the word of God and study it. And yet, if we don't decide, and I love the word he uses there, to walk in the commands of the Lord, that, that it actually impacts how I move and where I move. If the commands of God don't change how we walk, the blessings of God won't be yours that just hearing the information won't lead to transformation until it makes its way into your decisions. So we're saved by the grace of God and then we're meant to be led by our shepherd God according to his statutes. And my fear for many of you is, statistically speaking, you're in here about two Sundays a month and you hear the word of God two Sundays a month. But then seven and a half hours a day, every day, whatever screen you're in front of, a slow drip of the perspectives of the world shape your thinking. It determines your assumptions. It sets your priorities and shapes your life. And so you get exposure to the word of God that doesn't change your experience, but the way you walk and the way you move is entirely formed by the world instead of formed by the word. And David looks at Solomon and says, David, Solomon, you're going to be influenced by something. Someone's going to have your ear. Someone's going to talk to you. And you don't need it to be the way of wicked and violent men. You need it to be the way of the word of God. Walk here. Get in this book. Get this in you and uproot anything that would keep you away from walking faithfully with the Lord. And that would be my encouragement to you. Use this season to get serious about the ways of God. If I want his blessing, I need to know his words. See, coming in here and just getting information that, that doesn't lead to decisions won't lead to transformation. That, that's like uh, watching YouTube clips on how to eat healthy. It's a great thing to do. But when you're done, you're not any healthier. There's the potential, but the only way you're gonna reap the benefits is if you go to the grocery store, buy some vegetables, and then, here's the trick, then consume them let them assimilate and become part of you. And over time, you'll begin to experience the change. Do you see that? That makes sense, right? Uh, it's the same with the word of God. I need to get it into me, but not just get it into me. It needs to shape the way I move. What does he say about how do I handle money? What does he say about how I treat someone who hurt me? What does he say about how I handle romance? What does he say about how I handle my words? What does this book say about how I should walk? And if the way you walk is shaped by the world, then don't expect God to bless that. He can't. But we're meant to walk according to his word and uproot anything that gets in the way. I, I know for me, when I first graduated from college, I realized I'd been a believer in Jesus for years and most of the Bible I'd never read. But I had just gotten a job in ministry. I'm like, seems like I should at least have a cursory knowledge of this book. And beyond just the professional implications, I want to know God. If I say I love him, if I say that I care about him, I want to know his thoughts and I want them to shape mine. And yet I ran into a problem as a young man. I would sit with the word of God, but the screen on my TV would call to me. It would whisper sweet things of entertainments, just waiting. You've had a long day at work, Ben. Just turn on cable and let, let it wash over you, Right? And I realized I can't focus on this word when I'm distracted by the screen. So I got rid of my TV. I just threw it out of the house. I uprooted it so I could focus on the words of God. And it's fascinating. For years after that, I have people come up to me. I still have it now. People come up to me and they're like, I can tell you've been to seminary from the way you study the word of God. I'm like, oh, I have been to seminary. And it was wonderfully helpful. But everything I said today came from that time that 23, 24-year-old man was alone writing out books of the Bible. It started there getting rooted in this word. And let me encourage you. Yeah, amen. I thought that was good too, right? Um, all right. Um, waking up there, second gathering. All right, so yeah. Uh, 
I'm saying, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty if you own a television, all right? That's not the goal. Donna and I, when we got married, we ended up owning a TV. But we knew we had so many people tell us, man, your first year of marriage, so hard. Get ready for it. The long, cold winter of discontent. We're like, geez. And so we realized, you know what? We want to spend our first year of marriage really developing our communication. So we bought a little bitty TV that you could hold with a handle, and we would keep it in the closet. So when we wanted to watch a movie, we could. I would go get it out of the closet and set it up and find the wires and untangle them and plug in the DVD player and go get a DVD and we would watch it, but you would only go through that hassle if it was really worth watching. If it was like, I don't know, what do you want to do? Turn on TV was not really an option. You're like, oh man, do I want to go through all that? Not for this movie. So what are we going to do? Let's go for a walk. Let's visit. Let's talk about something else. Let's play a game. Let's invest in this relationship. And our first year of marriage was great because we prioritized that kind of intimacy. And let me encourage you. I don't care if you own a TV. I do now. It's totally fine. But what I'm saying is so many of us are shaped by our screens more than we're shaped by scripture. And I want that to be different. And Paul looks at, or excuse me, not Paul. David looks at Solomon and says, man, I'm begging you, get this word into you and then walk in its ways. Step by step. That's where the blessing is. That I'm saved by the grace of God. And I'm shaped by the word of God. It's the same with you and it's the same with me. Fast forward to Chronicles. We hear the story of David again. In Samuel, we saw a David who praises. In Kings, we saw a David that preaches. In Chronicles, we see a David who provides. And again, we don't have time to read it all, but let me give you a couple passages out of 1 Chronicles 28. It says in verse one, David assembled at Jerusalem all the officials of Israel, the officials of the tribes, the officers of the divisions that serve the king, the commander of thousands, the commander of hundreds, the stewards of all the property and livestock of the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the seasoned warriors. That's a powerful verse because really none of that existed before David became king. And what you see in that passage is what's beautiful about David is he left the kingdom better than he found it. That would be a great testimony of your life, would it not? I love the way the book of Acts said it about David. When he fulfilled his purposes for his generation, then he fell asleep. I pray that all the time. You don't know what will happen after you die, but you have purposes from God in your generation. You could fulfill them. David came into power over a loose confederation of tribes and he forged them into a country. They were surrounded by enemies and he subdued them. They had no rally point. He established the capital and he put at the center of that capital the worship of God and he wrote the worship hymn book to keep people focused on a Lord who could save. David did well, even though he failed many times. Here at the end, you see the blessing of David. And it says in verse two, then King David rose to his feet and said, hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations for building. But God said to me, you may not build a house for my name, for you are a man of war and have shed blood. David wanted to build the temple. And God told him, no, you are the warrior king. It's your son Solomon who will build in a time of peace. But what you get in what follows is not a bitter David. He's not, well, I wanted to build a temple and God wouldn't let me and I've been cheated in my life. Like he doesn't do that. Rather, he saw, hey, there's limits. All of us, particularly those of you who are a leader, you will always hit a limit. There'll be further you want to go. But that's the way death works. Death is an invitation to leave the party before the party's over. You know that, right? That's how I always think about it. If life is a party, at some point, the host will come tap your shoulder and go, you have to leave. You'll be like, what? But all my friends are still here and I wanted to talk to that girl and okay, I guess I'll see y'all later. That's, that's death. You'll be ushered out of the party and there'll always be things you'll want to have done. And yet David does something great here. David doesn't just praise God to the people. He doesn't just preach to the people. He provides for the people. On my way out, let me make sure I have blessed the next generation to the uttermost. And so here you see in 1 Chronicles 29, 1, it says, And David the king said to the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, the wood for the things of wood, beside great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. 
Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for this holy house, I have treasure of my own, of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God. 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of this house, and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold, silver for the things of silver. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? David says, I don't get to build this temple. That's, that's the job of the next generation. But anything I can do to help them know God and worship him, I'm gonna do it. Anything I can leverage. If they need plans, he wrote out the plans. If they need gold, I'm giving them gold. If they need silver, I'm giving them silver. If they need wood, I'm giving them wood. Anything that will help this next generation know and praise God, I'm gonna do that. And so David provides it. He said, I provided it as a king professionally and then I'm providing of my own stores personally. I wanna see this next generation praise the God who saved me. And then he turns and says, who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? He invites the congregation to do the same. It says, then the leaders of fathers' houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents, 10 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and on and on it goes. And it says in verse nine, then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David, the king also rejoiced greatly. And he said in verse 14, who am I? What is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly for all things come from you and of your own, you, and of your own we have given to you. Because we're strangers before you and sojourners as all of our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow. There's no abiding. But our Lord, our God, all this abundance that we provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you remember the band Sixpence, None the Richer. Uh, they were a Christian band, but sort of like secretly Christian, you know, uh, sort of uh, fantastic band. But I remember the lead singer was invited by David Letterman onto the show and he was kind of hitting on her. She was cute and whatever. And then he was like, you know, trying to uh, uh, just sort of wow her, or woo her. And then he asked, so what does the name Sixpence and the Richer mean? And she said, well, it's a quote from C.S. Lewis that, that when a child wants to buy a parent a gift, the child doesn't have any money. So the parents gives the kid money, a sixpence. And the kid goes and buys a gift and gives it to the parent. He says, so the parent delights in the gift from the child, but the, but the money came from the parent. So the parent is sixpence, none the richer. And it, it was a story of how God works. God gives you and I life and breath and everything else. And what we do is give it back to him. Not to supply some lack in God, he supplied it to us. But there's a delight that happens when we receive and give. And there's a joy that compounds in our heart and his and Letterman quit hitting on her after that. He was like, oh, oh that's profound. You know, it's it a cool moment. <laughs> but Lewis got that from David here. Hey, we're a shadow. We fade. I didn't come up with this stuff, and it's going into somebody else's hands. And like Ebenezer Scrooge at the end of his life, what did he see? He saw people mocking his cold, flinty heart, and he saw thieves distributing his goods. And he realized, I was selfish in life. My stuff will still go to someone else, but look, it's led to no good. The conversation's still ugly and the world's still dark. And so he begs for a chance to live so he can take the goods he cannot keep and distribute them for the sake of grace in the lives of other people. And he praises a God who gives him life. Why? So he can use the means in that life to be generous. And David does the same here. He praises a God who saves. He preaches, walk with that God. That's where your blessing lies. And then he provides. And whatever I can do to lean into a generation that they can be a part of worshiping that same God, I'm gonna do it. And you see, that's what Ebenezer Scrooge did. When he woke up, what happened? He was so thrilled he was still alive. What'd he do? He started buying stuff for little tiny Tim, the whole crew, right? Because it's in generosity that his life became full and people became blessed. It's the same with you and same with me. Uh, I've got a friend that, I have discovered is enormously generous. And I say discovered because he doesn't broadcast it, but he gave to ministries that I've led through history. But, but I, I sort of find out things he's given to in life because I watch him. And I remember once we were at a football game, college football game, and uh, I was there sitting with him at the game. And during halftime, they do all kinds of different stuff on the field. And at one point, they, they lead out all these young people and they're making a comment about these young people. And they say at one point, every person you see on the field 
is the first person in their family to ever go to college. And I remember when they say that, people who are eating nachos talking turn, and they're like, what? That's amazing. And starts clapping like, what an opportunity. That's so cool. What, what potential to change the trajectory of their family to get an education like this? And they said, so we just want to give special thanks to the person who provided for all their college education. And then they named the guy I was sitting next to. And I was like, what? I said, I hadn't found that one. And he was embarrassed. He was like, they weren't supposed to say that. I'm like, Man, that's your side gig? That's your side gift? Changing the lives of humans, giving them an education in Jesus' name? What an awesome life. What a great testimony. What a beautiful way to live, to say, man, God's provided for me. I'm gonna provide for others. And let me tell you, some of you may go, well, that's nice. If I have enough money to provide extra college experiences for people, I'll do that, Ben. I'll keep that in mind. Well, look, you may not be able to fund people's college, but there were 40 kids last Sunday that it was real unsure if they were gonna get a gift under the Christmas tree. And you guys solved that. One Sunday, there's gonna be kids in a couple weeks here that are gonna open a Christmas present from the people of Jesus. That's a good story. So even if your Christmas is lame, it's Christmas Eve, you're like, this Christmas is the worst ever. Call your mind to some kid sitting in some house in DC that's opening a present because of you. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. That's a great way to live life. That I want to praise a God who saves me when I didn't deserve it. I want to preach a God who's worthy of my trust and I'm going to follow him in the way I live and move and act. And then I'm going to provide it for the name and glory of God, whatever I can so the next generation can know him. It's interesting here in Chronicles, David is providing for the temple I didn't read it, but Samuel actually ends with a, with a bizarre story that connects to it. Samuel gives us the last words of David. And then after the last words of David, there's like an appendices in 2 Samuel of, of little stories of David's life. And the last one's a weird one. It's about David sinning against God and, and a plague breaks out and people begin to die. And David sees judgment coming because of sin. And he sees that this plague is as it's advancing, situated in this one particular city, and rather than moving away from a plague to flee it, the king runs towards the plague. And he runs towards it, and he gets into that city, and he takes an innocent lamb, and he sacrifices it there on a hilltop, just asking God if perhaps the shed blood of an innocent one might cover his sin so destruction passes by. He, he's basically in his own frail way reenacting Exodus in hope that in Exodus when, when judgment was coming on the land of Israel God told them the, the blood of an innocent lamb can cover your doorpost and if you do that just say hey God someone has to pay for my violation of your law my destruction will pass by and David in his own rudimentary way does this and guess what the destruction ends and as he stands there he's like this is holy ground I want to buy this. And the dude who owned it was standing there like, hey, bro, that was nuts. You can have it. <laughs> and David's like, no, no, I want to buy it. I will not give God something that costs me nothing. And he buys this piece of land, this hilltop called Moriah, which is weird because if you remember Genesis, that's the same hilltop that Abraham stood on when he was going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to the Lord. And God stopped him. God said, no, you don't offer your kid for me. I'm going to provide a sacrifice for you. And on that very mountain, God tells Abraham, it's through your seed, I'm going to send a rescuer who will bless the whole world. And God declares that story to him while God stops him. You don't sacrifice for me. God provides a ram, an innocent lamb. His sacrifice, his blood will cover you in your sin. Same mountain. Mount Moriah. And now here, generations later, David is standing on that mound with Solomon and says, we're going to build a temple right here because the law tells us in the Old Testament that the way the temple's built, it, it looked like the Garden of Eden. All, all the architecture was about fruit and trees and yet in the middle of it was the holiest of holies where God dwelt and no human can go in there. Though we're beautiful in the image of God, we can't enter. We're, we're cast out of the garden. And yet once a year, a, a priest would come in with a, with a lamb and 
sacrifice it, and with its blood, spread it on the violated law of the Ten Commandments of Moses. And the picture was, our sin keeps us from intimacy with God, but the blood of an innocent one can cover our sin so we can have relationship with God again. And that temple, that place of sacrifice, David says, we're going to build that right here on the same mountain. And David declares in each one of these passages, we didn't read it, the same God who promised Abraham that from him would come a seed that would bless the whole world. He promised me that'll be a Davidic seed. A king will come from me who will sit on the throne forever. But here's what's wild. When his son did come, the seed we'd been waiting for, the son of David, Jesus Christ, when that true king came, the one Brennan mentioned that Isaiah preached about, the one that would come that would sin on the throne of David, the wonderful counselor, the prince of peace, mighty God. When he arrived on the scene, his announcer, John the Baptist, stood up and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the earth. That you see that the son of David, the true king, the seed we were waiting for, Jesus Christ, was the king of all kings and he was the sacrifice of all sacrifices. That he was the sacrifice all these earlier sacrifices pointed to. The blood of bulls and goats can't cover sin. And yet all of us are made in the image of God and are beautiful but are broken because of sin. And yet God laid on, the iniqu on him the iniquity of us all. And when Jesus Christ, the son of David, went out and was crucified on that hilltop, the scriptures tell us that he who knew no sin became sin for you and for me. And when he laid out his life, his blood, the temple curtain ripped open. The distance between God and man was removed. Intimacy with God arrives again. Why? Because of the sacrifice of the son of David, of the true lamb who takes away the sins of the world. David didn't, I don't think, fully know at that moment what he was doing. He was setting up in Jerusalem, setting up the testimony and a monument to the king of all kings, the son of David, his son, who's the sacrifice for you and for me. So friend, I don't know where you are today in your life and your understanding of who God is, but let me tell you something. You are beautiful in God's image, but broken because of sin. You need a God who saves and that's what we have. Jesus Christ takes away the sins of the world. That's who he is. That's why he's come. That's why we celebrate Christmas that in the city of David is born a king the one who will take away your sin and mine. And when you come to know him, then I want to encourage you to walk with him. Follow that Advent journey. Get in the word of God. Decide I'm going to be someone who's scraped, shaped by the word of God more than I'm shaped by the concerns of the world. And then as your opportunity comes to bless, lean into the next generation. Let the testimony of your life be, I built an altar of praise to a God who will save anybody. David was not perfect. We looked at it over the last couple weeks and neither are you and neither am I. I think of it often that if we were asked to make a highlight reel of your life, pending on what scenes we grab would lead a real different sense, wouldn't it? We could make a highlight reel of every one of our lives where you look like the villain. And we can make a highlight reel of your life where you look like a saint. And the truth is, you're both. You're beautiful in the image of God, but you're a mess. And so am I. How does a sinner like David get into the kingdom? Because God saves. Same way a sinner like you and a sinner like me gets in the kingdom. Because God saves. And so David's life ends pointing at the eternal covenant of the Son of God, the Son of David, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. I want my life to point at him. I want your life to point at him. Where your hope is found, where your life is led, where your giving goes, I want your life to be leveraged to proclaim to a world there is a God who's worthy of your trust. Do you know him? He's not just a rock. He's got to be yours. He's not just a salvation. Is he yours? And the best gift this Christmas is for you to receive the gift God sent, his son, that you might live through him.